Hi, everybody. I'm Charles, and thanks for stopping by. Uh, this video will be a fairly lengthy overview of Marcel Proust's Remembrance of Things Past, or if you prefer, In Search of Lost Time. If you came across this video without watching those I uploaded about individual volumes, I recommend you watch those first, since some of what I say here assumes familiarity with the story and characters. There's a link to those videos below. Most of this video focuses on the novel overall. Then there will be a short answer to the question, is it worth reading? If that is your primary interest, you can jump ahead to that chapter of the video. Eventually, I will be producing a separate video about Harold Pinter's famous screenplay based on Remembrance because it raises several issues about the relationship between film and literature. Based on those observations, I plan to include speculation about how the finished film might have looked, sounded, and moved. If that piques your interest, <laughs> please subscribe and check the notification icon so you can know when the video is ready. Thanks again for your interest, and I will talk to you later, or actually very soon, <laughs> right after this. To get started, I'll share comments made by friends about my plan to read all seven volumes. One, unfamiliar with Proust, asked why I wanted to do it. I said that I wanted to move past the famous Madeleine incident for a better understanding of the novel's reputation. His wife added that most people don't read much beyond that opening. A third friend said he's never read Proust, but has eaten plenty of Madeleines. <laughs> Clearly, the novel occupies a special place, but aside from literature majors who have to read the whole book, Anyone who wants to demonstrate knowledge of Proust is probably ready to drop the Mad Len in a conversation the way Proust dumped his in a cup of tea. It is like a password to a literary cocktail party that proves your education. Add a quick reference to involuntary memory, and you sound like an expert which, given much of the novel's focus on empty social rituals, is almost appropriate. That trivialization is perhaps inevitable, given the demands the book puts on a reader. But reducing the novel to a single theme overlooks how its broad canvas of time, place, and character is experienced through individual, almost idiosyncratic detail. I've mentioned, for example, that aside from the first and last volumes, the exact time in which the action occurs is often unclear. This cloudiness can frustrate and confuse, but it renders social and historical change through individual experience. The social trauma of the Dreyfus affair, for example, is introduced almost casually, with no attempt to locate it in the progression of time, but always in terms of the individual's personal reasons for being pro or anti-Dreyfus, and never with any pretense of dealing with the controversies or historical legacy. Paradoxically, the temporal confusion supports Proust's focus on memory as an emotional expression of time, since events can be recounted out of sequence to be stranded on the sea of history. Instead of the impersonal ticking of a clock, emotions and metaphor move the reader from an incident in one period to another. Marcel might describe a woman who has caught his attention, for example. He compares her smile to a breaking dawn that inspires a cacophony of birdsong, reminiscent of the sound of the orchestra tuning up at the performance where Marcel sees the woman, who has now turned her back to him to converse with another man whose features are less important to Proust than the aristocratic lineage of which he is the latest scion, and so on. This equation of metaphor with action makes Proust's digressive style central to the experience. The words course like a mellifluous mountain stream to connect otherwise distant, discrete events and sensations. 
The translator for Volume 7 points out Hearst's debt to the Goncourt brothers, and his fluid, unpredictable style applied to seeming banality often feels like a cross between a journal and a gossip column. It looks like autobiography, but it is more like an imitation of a journal, a mimicking of immediacy and trivial observation written with an emotional resonance beyond a simple record. Events seem to occur now rather than 10, 15, or 20 years earlier. At any one time, we are unclear whether what we are reading is of the moment or an exquisitely distilled essence of something from the past sustained by the flow of memory and sensation. Nonetheless, the story is often more conventional than the lyricism suggests. If Remembrance is an autobiography, it is the record of a life shaped by narrative and dramatic convention. How much the melodrama, suspenseful delays, and emotional buildups result from Proust believing they were effective storytelling, and how much they unconsciously shape experience may be impossible to answer, but worth asking. When, for example, Marcel just happens to end up in the male brothel patronized by the Baron de Charlou, who just happens to be caught in a degrading encounter, or when Volume 5 ends with the cliffhanger of Albertine leaving Marcel, or when she suddenly dies in an accident in Volume 6, or when Robert de saint Lou assaults a total stranger for reasons that become clear only hundreds of pages later. The wheels of dramatic contrivance need the oil of Proust's elegant digression. At the very least, these dramatic conveniences suggest Proust's storytelling imagination was not equal to his descriptive powers. Fortunately, such blatant contrivances pale against the fantastically complex characters who rarely, as characters, behave melodramatically, except as a self-conscious pose. Proust's method demands a fairness and tolerance towards all his characters, including those Marcel does not like. No one is perfect or perfectly awful, least of all Marcel, who is often ruthless in his self-criticism. Even the most potentially repellent character, the Baron, is also the most fascinating, so richly contradictory that it is as impossible to moralize about his behavior as it is to predict what he will do or say next. The Baron is effectively the aesthetic conscience of the novel, an image of a human animal best understood through the kaleidoscope of his flaws and virtues. Or, to mix metaphors, he holds a mirror up to all of us that we might understand our own failings. If the Baron demonstrates the ineffable complexities of human behavior, Albertine does so less successfully. Like all the women in the novel, she is always seen from the outside. Like Marcel, we have to guess, interpret, interpolate what she is thinking at any one moment. And as I noted in one of my earlier videos, Proust ably convinces Marcel is, or was, in love with her, but does not move us to share his feelings. Unlike the detached, impersonal narrator of traditional fiction, who can fully enter his or her characters to give all their breadth and depth, Proust can go no further than Marcel's feelings. He is trapped in the reality of never being able to enter someone else's head. Thus, Gilbert Albertine, the Duchesse du Guermont, his grandmother, even his ancient servant Françoise are always only Marcel's projected image of them filtered through his own feelings. He can intuit the sometimes contradictory, often complex motivations and behavior of the men because he is a man. He can only project his fantasies onto the women and assume they are thinking what he thinks they are. The male characters are no more likable than the women. Indeed, they seem somewhat puny next to the women's charms, even if that appeal results from Proust's failure to enter into their consciousness. How much these failings result from Proust's homosexuality and denial of it is a controversial topic that I will not explore, because I do not believe any work of art can be explained by the artist's biography. Remembrance may lend itself to such narrow discussion more than most novels because of the quasi-autobiographical content, and there is much in the book to justify such an approach. 
It might provide an elegant and concise interpretation, but it would still be reductive. For above all else, Remembrance of Things Past is a work about how life's effervescent complexity eludes our powers of description, even as we try to hold it, pin it down, turn it into something we can explain, all the while knowing that it is impossible. Or, as Proust put it in the closing pages of Volume 7, even if I did not have the leisure to prepare, and this was a much more important matter, the hundred masks which ought properly to be attached to a single face, if only because of all the eyes that see it, and the different meanings they read into its features, as well as for the same eyes the effect of hope and fear, or, on the contrary, the love and habit which for thirty years can cancel the changes wrought by age, even if I was not in the end proposing, although my relationship with Albertine had been enough to show that anything else is factitious and untruthful, to represent certain individual is not as outside but as inside us, where their least acts can entail fatal disturbances and to vary the light of the moral sky according to the differing pressures of our sensibility, or when disturbing the serene skies of our certainty, beneath which an object is so small, the slightest cloud of danger multiplies its size in a moment. If I could not use these changes and many others, the necessity for which, if one intends to depict reality, has become apparent in the course of this narrative. The transcription of a universe which had to be completely redesigned, at least I would not fail to describe the man within it as possessing the length not of his body, but of his years, and as being obliged in a task that grows more and more enormous, and which in the end defeats him, to drag them with him whenever he moves. If you have been interested enough to watch these videos, you can no doubt anticipate that I will answer yes, it is worth reading. But by what measure of worth? In my first video, I noted that I hoped to improve my own writing by ingesting some of Proust's techniques. I'll leave it to others to determine how successful I might be in that goal. But to return to where we started, it is probably true that given its length and complexity, Remembrance is read today more out of obligation than desire. The amount of time and effort necessary to read it is just not practical for most people, even if they are interested in it. Its importance in the history of Western literature is probably secure, however, assuming that the corrosive attentions of identity ideologues do not succeed in censoring it for its sexism, homophobia, and cultural elitism. So, if it remains available, would I recommend it? Yes, if, and it's a big if, you recognize that you are committing to a work that makes major demands on the reader. Beautiful in passages, it is as easy to admire as it is sometimes difficult to get through. The sensuous, evocative style, which was my main reason for reading it, is not all there is to the book, but the content is limited by one man's projection of his personal experience. Proust is open about that limitation, and even makes it central to his method. That makes the writing honest as well as beautiful, but the going is no easier for the frankness. The overture in Swan's Way introduces Proust's style and method, a densely textured memory of a time and place that includes the famous Madeleine moment. It can be enjoyed for itself as a satisfying sample of what is best in the novel. If you are entranced by it, however, do not assume that what follows will be uniformly transportive. On the other hand, if you finish Swan's Way, I advise continuing through the remaining six volumes. As daunting a prospect as that may be, the embracing achievement of remembrance can be fully appreciated only by reading the whole thing.